gentlemen, the victor of Copenhagen. Lord Nelson, your decisive defeat of the Danes has made it possible for the British government to negotiate this honorable and, I must say, unexpected peace with France. We all believe with the deepest conviction that we shall have at last peace. Now, here, 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 here. Lord Spencer, gentlemen, you are celebrating a peace with Napoleon Bonaparte. Peace is a very beautiful word, as long as the impulse of peace is behind it. But gentlemen, you will never make peace with Napoleon. He doesn't mean peace today. He just wants to gain a little time uh, to rearm himself at sea and make new alliances with Italy and Spain, all to one purpose, to destroy our empire. Years ago, I said the same thing at Naples. I begged them, I entreated them not to give way, but they wouldn't listen to me and they paid the price. That was a little kingdom miles away in the Mediterranean. But now it is England, our own land. Napoleon can never be master of the world until he has smashed us up. And believe me, gentlemen, he means to be master of the world. You cannot make peace with dictators. You have to destroy them, wipe them out. Gentlemen, I implore you, Speak to the Prime Minister before it is too late. Do not ratify this peace. We, uh, appreciate all you say. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I felt it my duty to tell you of these things. I'm not a statesman, of course. I'm no diplomat. I must leave it in your hands. Thank you, uh, home in Norfolk, Nelson? I don't know. I don't think so. My wife tells me she saw Lady Nelson in Bath recently. Yes, she's very well. She gives her time to social work. Ah, and uh, shall you go to Venice? Uh, why Venice? Ooh, uh, something I heard the other day. Little party to some musical festival, Lady Hamilton, a few English friends. Uh... Where did you hear this? It was that little musical chap. Came over to Covent Garden to conduct. Heard him say something about Lady Hamilton going back with him. <laughs> well, uh, I dare say I've got it all mixed up. Well, it's good to see you home again. Why, your lordship. Good afternoon, Mrs. Cadogan. Sit down, please. Everything is in such a mess. Why this sudden move from Piccadilly to Nero's Hotel? Well, well, you see, everything was so dull and dismal since since Sir William died. Emma couldn't stand it any longer. I see. Where is she now? Well, she, went, she went out quite early with a little foreign musical gentleman there. They're driving in the park. Oh. May I wait? Yes, please. Look at the flowers. Aren't they pretty? So nice for a young widow. <laughs> yes. Horatio. I'm so sorry. Have you been here long? Oh, no. Emma, dear, I just came in by chance. Your mother has been telling me why you moved from Piccadilly. I think you're quite right. It was so very gloomy there. I haven't seen a great deal of you since I've been back, Emma. Well, you know what it's like. There's so much to do and arrange. How is the child? To be perfectly honest with you, I don't quite like. What things do you mean? Three times this week I have tried to see you, and each time you've had appointments with people whom I don't know and whom I don't wish to know. We had no secrets at one time, even in our letters. Oh, you surely do not ask to see all my letters. Well, certainly I do not ask to see them, my dear, if you want to hide them from me. You're jealous. Why do you make fun of me? Fun? I've never been so happy in all my life. You're splendid when you're jealous. You must promise me to be jealous always, please. We were talking about some letters, weren't we? Read them. I'm sorry. Forgive me. 
I'll see you later. No, Horatio, don't go. You know what will happen if you leave them unopened. We shall never quite understand each other again. They're quite short and to the point. Bills, bills, and more bills. Threats and summonses and lawsuits. I'm up to my neck in them. I'm drowned in them. Why do you think I left Piccadilly? Not because I wanted to. My dear, they threw me out. And why do you think I haven't seen our child for two weeks? Because I owe Mrs. Gibson 15 guineas for the rent. Do you think I like going out with that little man from Venice? I hate the sight of him. But I have to do it because he's promised me a contract at his opera house. Yes, I'm going back to work. I've done it before and I can do it again. I don't really mind. You see, Horatio, William didn't leave me a farthing. Why wasn't I told? Why should you be told? These are my troubles, not yours. I've never asked anyone for money and I never shall. Indeed. And are you out of your senses? Now you listen to me and don't answer back. How dare you keep those bills from me? Aren't your worries my worries? Everything I have is yours. Everything. You're going to have a home of your own. And there is going to be no sorrow and no trouble ever again. Emma. Dear Emma. That's the best drop of rum I've tasted since the old days. <laughs> we don't get much excuse to open the bottle lately. You should come here often. <laughs> it warms the cockles of your heart. <laughs> Captain Hardy, how nice to see you again. Why didn't you tell us you were coming? Well, to tell you the truth, my lady, I just happened to be passing and thought I'd come and see you. Will you stay to luncheon? Oh, <laughs> thank you, my lady. Mother, darling, tell the coachman we leave at two. I want to have the child here before dark. Yes, dear, I'll tell him. Come along, he's in the garden. We will see his work of art in the summer house. Uh, I don't want to disturb him, lady. I, I know he likes his peace and quiet. Why? Just because he won't see St. Vincent and Keith when they write him pompous letters. Oh, no, Hardy, you're different. You're an old friend. Come along. No, uh, to tell you the truth, Lady Hamilton, I didn't come to see him. I came to see you. Me? Yes. There's no chance of our being overheard, is it? No, but what is the mystery? <laughs> well, uh, do you ever read the newspapers down here? Not unless we can help it. We're not particularly interested in the court news, nor the gossip or scandal. Well, then you may have missed what happened. Bonaparte has made himself Emperor of France, England. Oh, ridiculous. So it may sound, milady. That's what we all thought when we first heard it. But it's true, this piece was no good. It'll break any day now. This self-styled emperor has made an alliance with Spain. He's raked together a new fleet from goodness knows where, and he's building transports and barges as fast as he can turn them out. From Boulogne to Brest, every single channel port is chock full of them. He's got a whole army behind him waiting to embark. A few weeks from now, all he'll need is a fair wind. And all you'll need will be Nelson. <laughs> yes, that's it, my lady. Is that all? That's all, my lady. Will you stay? No, thank you, lady. I think perhaps I'd better get back. Goodbye, Hardy. Did you tell Hardy I would go? Yes. It's a matter of course, dear, isn't it? It'll be pleasing tonight on the high roads off the downs. 
Yes, I think I'll take the little rug I use in my study. Oh, yes, I know. I'll get it. I'll get it, Mother. that every man will do his duty. You must be quick, but I have one more to follow, which is for close action. That will do, make it directly. You know, those Frenchmen have sharpshooters up in the rigging, sir. I know, why do you tell me? I think it's wise to wear all those decorations and orders. They make a nice target. I won them in battle, didn't I? Yes, sir, but I shall wear them in battle.
not badly hurt, are you, sir? My back shot. Stay on deck, Hartley. Come to me when you can. Cover my face. These decorations. No time for the men to see me like this. Spine is broken. We are unhappily for our country. Nothing can be done for you. Flagship has surrendered, sir. Good. Why don't they bring Hardy to me? He sends a message, sir. We are against the redoubtable. When we have beaten her, he will come. Great victory. Yes, me. Lady. Do you 
you come from Portsmouth, Hardy? No, Spithead, Lady Hamilton. I came on the St. George. She's our fastest ship. Captain Blackwood went ahead to London with the news. What is the news, Hardy? It was a great victory. The greatest we've ever known. It's wonderful. It was nine days ago we engaged them off Cape Trafalgar, the combined fleets of France and Spain. They've been destroyed. The oceans are free once more and England is saved from invasion. The first cannon was fired a little after 12. Within one hour, five French ships of the line had struck their flags. His plan was magnificent. He swung our fleet from line of battle into two spearheads that broke the enemy line into three separate parts. Then, about 1.30, I was walking with him on the upper deck. The fighting was at its height. The French flagship, the Redoubtable, came through the smoke, and we fought alongside one another. He was so confident. We just turned to go back to the... <laughs> By sunset, everything was over. But he, he lived to know that he'd won England's greatest victory. His, his last thoughts were with you, milady. That you should be cared for. Terrific movie. At the time Alexander Corder produced and directed this movie in Hollywood, the U.S. was still officially taking an isolationist policy towards Nazi Germany, despite Adolf Hitler's aggressions in Europe, including his bombing of Britain. Well, those speeches that Lawrence Olivier, as Lord Nelson, delivers in the movie, encouraging swift military action against dictators, led to Corder being subpoenaed to appear before a Senate subcommittee in Washington, D.C., which was investigating pro-war propaganda in Hollywood movies. He was scheduled to appear December 12, 1941. But five days earlier, of course, Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Japanese. The U.S. was immediately plunged into World War II, and that ended any thoughts of wartime isolationism on the part of the U.S. Up next, Robert Donat and Deborah Carr are a married couple, briefly separated because of World War II, and come back together, totally changed, in a romantic film from the brothers Corda 
in the mid-1940s. Tonight on Turner Classic Movies, we're ripe for more from the Quarter Brothers next with Alexander's vacation from marriage. Then, Brother Vincent aids in the design of The Third Man, and Laurence Olivier pledges his allegiance to the Queen and Alexander's fire over England. TCM is en fuego tonight. I want you to meet a new guy what's going to be with us. This is, uh, uh, Caesar Enrico Vandello. Oh, little Caesar, huh? Yeah, sure. That's him. Edward G. Robinson was a major movie star for 40 years in all kinds of roles, but nobody ever forgot little Caesar. Nobody ever stopped thinking of him as a gangster, and personally, I know what that's like. No matter how many movies I make, how many things I do, when people think of Chaz Palminteri, they think of A Bronx Tale or Bullets Over Broadway, The Gangsters. That and the fact that we both started out on the stage, in live theater. But all that goes away when I watch him. That's when I see the sheer force of his personality. The way this little guy could take over a movie and make you believe. I want you to wake up in the night and see your own squashy, putrid little soul. I want you to know that every human being that works for you knows what a diseased hypocrite you are. We all know what you are, but we take your money and do your work because we're afraid to starve. Robinson is on screen. You want him to stay there. When he's not, you can't wait till he comes back. He gave you a left eye to nail me, wouldn't you? Huh? <laughs> you can see the headlines, can't you? Yeah. Well, listen, Hick. I was too much for any big city police force to handle. They tried, but they couldn't. When I talk about him, I start out saying, Edward G. Robinson this, Edward G. Robinson that. By the next sentence, I'm calling him Edward G. And then forget it, it's Eddie. Like I know the guy. But that's just the point. Eddie reaches the audience in a way that ordinary actors can't. Look at Little Caesar. All through the movie, he's a psychopath. Right on the edge. Scary like nobody in the movies had ever been before. Shoot, Rico. I look at Eddie here and I see anguish. Not just weakness, but despair. Every bit as real as the anger. Watch him play both emotions. That takes so much talent to show rage and love simultaneously. The thing that Eddie has is honesty. He's always real and in the moment. I remember the sea wolf. He plays a ship's captain, a power-mad intellectual, Nothing like Little Caesar, but just as convincing. Look in his eyes. Look at his heart. He's always right there. My strength justifies me, Mr. Van Wyden. The fact that I can kill you and let you live as I choose. The fact that I control the destinies of all on board the ship. The fact that it's my will and my will alone that rules here. When you have that kind of power, movies start to revolve around you. Even in a great film like Double Indemnity, in a small role, Eddie becomes the conscience of the movie, the moral center. It's like a clock running through the film, the one guy you follow, the one who keeps the movie grounded. Walter, smart, tricky, almost perfect, but I think Papa has it all figured out. Figured out and wrapped up in tissue paper with pink ribbons on it. I can show you a million examples, but there's no way a few clips can do justice to Eddie's career. You have to watch the movies to see the way he changes his style over the years. He wasn't always a tough guy. He wasn't always intense. He did great comic variations on his gangster character. No matter what Eddie does, it just can't help loving the guy. You're the only one who was ever in my life and ever will be. I'm sorry, baby. I think I know how you feel. And I'm going to give you a chance to prove it. How? You love me? Oh, do I? Put that rope around my legs, will you? My ankles are getting cold. Some people say that as an actor, you put a mask on. I've never believed that, and I don't think Eddie did either. I think we take mask off. Eddie wrote about acting. This tells you how seriously he took the job. These are his words. Every one of us bears within him the possibility of all passions, all destinies of life, in all its manifold forms. 
Nothing human is foreign to us. That's what an actor has to do. Reach for every possibility, every human passion. If you want to see how it's done, Edward G. Robinson. For Turner Classic Movies, I'm Chaz Palminteri. Gangster Edward G. Robinson hides from the law when he trades places with his mild-mannered double in the whole town's talking. Sunday at 8 p.m., only on Turner Classic Movies. I'd like to tell you about The Quiet Man. He's John Wayne in a picture you'll soon be cheering. It's the story of Sean Thornton, a right intended man who came from America to forget his past in Innisfree. There he met a fiery red-headed lass, and the village marriage broker went to work. That's a pretty bonnet you have on. Bonnet? Don't you be talking to me about bonnet. After leaving mine stuck up there like a... Easy now. Have the good manners not to hit the man until he's your husband, and until he'll hit you back. Then her bully of a brother, Red Will Danaher, refused to pay her rightful dowry. Come on. There'll be no locks or bolts between us, Mary Kate, except those in your own mercenary little heart. Mary Kate left him to go to Dublin, but he caught her at the station and brought her back with the whole town watching him do it. I'll pay you. Never! Then the fight was on. A fight they're still talking about in Innisfree. It's a wonderful picture. The finest ever brought to the screen by John Ford. And he's won three Academy Awards. His direction makes unforgettable the performances of John Wayne, Maureen O'Hara, Barry Fitzgerald, and Victor McLaughlin. <laughs> The mind strains for a glimpse of the wonders of tomorrow. For science, the lights go on, serving mankind. There are... I've been married for five years. The first three years, we were very happy, but lately, Alice and I aren't getting along. Mr. Agony, I've got a problem. Speak up, speak up. Well. It's so loud. Well, it all started about the time I got the new job with the trucking company. Oh, so you're a truck driver. Oh, no, I don't drive. I work in the office. Oh. Mm. Go on. Well, just to show you how unreasonable a woman can be, Take the time I invited a couple of the boys from the trucking company up to the house for the evening. It would have been different if I'd had a lot of people up, but this was just a nice little social gathering. A couple began to show her disapproval and in a way that everybody could see. She actually embarrassed me the way she treated those wonderful, charming, and considerate people. Mr. Agony, they would just as well behaved as they could be. You'd have thought my friend... <laughs> Where you going, Gary, on a trip? Come on, baby. Out of my way. Hey, Joe, your wife's leaving. Alice, honey. That's all right, dearie. Alice. And that's all that happened. Honestly, Mr. Agony, I don't understand what's wrong with Alice. The slightest little thing, and she packs her... Oh, no. Like the time we decided to have Thanksgiving alone. You know, no relatives. She promised not to ask her family, and I said I wouldn't invite mine. Well? Oh, would you answer that, dear? Happy Thanksgiving! Oh, just a minute. Honey, it's for you. It's your mother. Oh, oh, oh 
Oh, here, hold these. Oh, oh be careful with that. Why don't you tell me? Oh, Mother dear. Well, yes, I, I was just sort of preparing the turkey. Well, of course we're having turkey, Mother. No, Alice, don't we? Yes, well, yes, I... I guess we have enough. Oh, honey, honey. No, we'll... no, no trouble at all. Listen, remember what we said. Joe, please. Well, yes, of course, bring Daddy. No! Joe. Yes, and Horace, too. No, not Horace. Joe, for heaven's sake. Yes, three o'clock will be fine. Mm -hmm. Just look, why did you have to go and do that? You know we wanted to have dinner alone. You know how your father eats. Well, what could I do after all? They are my parents. And that, that, that Horace, why did you have to ask him? Don't you talk that way about my brother. Uh oh Hello. Oh, oh, just a minute. It's for you. It's your mother. Here, hold it. It's hot. Oh! Hello, Mom. What are you doing today? Well, call it off. You're having Thanksgiving dinner Joe, with you us. Can't. Oh, can I? Yeah, that's right. It's open house at the McDokes today. Sure, you and Dad and Cousin Ellie. Oh, the kids there, too? Well, bring them along. The more, the merrier. Joe McDokes, you did that just out of spite. You you know I don't have enough turkey for all those, those, those people. Oh, so now my family are people, huh? Oh. Ah, well, let me tell you something, young lady. They may be people, but they don't eat like your family. And that Horace, he could have a turkey all to himself. I told you to leave my brother out of it. Okay, so we'll leave him out of it. And stop basting that turkey. You'll drive me crazy. Joe, ah. Oh, Joe McDokes, you deliberately ruined our thing. Thanksgiving dinner! Okay, so I ruined our Thanksgiving dinner and I'm glad! This is the end. I worked and slaved my fingers to the bone for the last time. I'm going home to Mother! Okay, go on home to Mother and you can, you can, you can give her the bird for me! <laughs> no. Yes. Now, Mr. Agony, my problem is this. Should I tell her? Oh, you can't ever tell a woman she snores. Why, she'd pack her bags and never come back. Yeah, I know. My boy, you do have a problem. However, your marriage is worth preserving at all costs. Marriage is the most sacred of all our institutions. Go home to your wife, swallow your pride, and start life anew. But what about the snoring? Snoring? Well, uh, get her a snowball. A snowball? But, Mr. Agony, I... That is my advice to you. But, but, what's a snowball? Next case, please. And uh, your uh, problem, madam? <laughs> Remember, it's just like belling the cat. Joe, did you put the cat out? Cat! Oh, cat. I certainly hope that milkman doesn't rattle the bottles again at 3 a.m. Honestly, I never get a good night's sleep anymore. No, neither do I. Joe? I didn't say a thing, honey, not a thing. Well, you were thinking it. Remember, it's just like belling the cat. Isn't it awful the way husbands are murdering their wives lately? Joe, what are you doing? I, uh, I just want to kiss you goodnight. Well, good night. Here's another one. Choked to death and right in her own bed. Honestly, it isn't even safe to get married any longer. Why would any man want to choke his wife? What are you doing, Joe? I uh, just want to kiss you goodnight. What's the matter with you? Go to bed. Would you believe it, Joe? That man choked his wife just after kissing her goodnight. <laughs> Joe, what was that? What? What, that noise? I didn't hear anything. Honey, your, your nerves are a little upset. You better take a sleeping pill. Yes, I guess I better. Uh, better take two. Joe, are you sure you put the cat out? Uh-huh. And Joe, turn off that light. Stop screaming out. I want to kiss you goodnight. Kiss you goodnight. You're snoring! You're snoring! Joe, I was not! You are 
too, and you sounded like a foghorn. Joe McDokes, I warned you about accusing me of snoring. And, and what's this thing? That's a snowball for people who snore. Oh, oh Joe McDokes, this is the end. I'm going home to Mother, and this time for good. Oh, we're getting a divorce! Well, that's the way it goes. More marriages are ending up in the divorce courts every day. How do you like it, Joe, this living alone? Living alone? Who's living alone? You mean Alice didn't get a divorce? Are you kidding? The kid's crazy about me. But what about the snoring? Music to my ears. 